Good afternoon and welcome to the DeYoung Museum. My name is Devin Malone and I'm the Director of Public Programs and Community Engagement at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco. I'm so excited about this afternoon's program, Reckoning with the Past and Reclaiming the Future, a conversation with contemporary artist Lola Amira. This program marks the opening of the exhibition, Lola Amira, Facing the Future, which launches FAMSF's Contemporary African Art Program. Shortly, you'll hear from both Lola Amira and head of this initiative, curator Natasha Becker. To share more about our speakers, Lola Amira with Kanyasili Mbongwa was born in 1984 in Guguletu, South Africa, and currently lives in Cape Town, South Africa. Amira's practice includes appearance, photography, video, and sculpture presented under the term constellations, defined as a sacred space and gesture towards sacred healing. The artist Lola Amira is an ancestral body coexisting in the body of Mbongwa. The pronouns they, them, and their are used in appearances and in conversation about their plural existence. Amira was recently included in the 22nd Biennial of Sydney and a recent installation at Savvy Contemporary in Berlin. Natasha Becker is the inaugural curator of African art at the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco and oversees the permanent collection of 19th and 20th century art from West and Central Africa. In her work at the museums, she is exploring new curatorial concepts, acquisition strategies, and special exhibitions that will interpret the African art collection as a living and evolving culture and practice. Thanks again, and please join me in welcoming Lola Amira and Natasha Becker. Thank you, Devin, and thank you to you all for uh, coming to the talk this afternoon. Welcome. I'm going to say a few words before Lola, Amira and I sit down to uh, the conversation. And um, these were the words that um, we shared at uh, the you know, official opening of the exhibition as well. And it's really to um, call attention to the de Young's collection. Um, the museum's collection of African art is a celebration of the historical and contemporary arts of Africa and the African diaspora. Africa is considered to be the birthplace of modern humanity, the location from which the earliest migrations of people moved across the globe. The continent was also the site upon which our ancestors first expressed abstract thought in visual terms and intentionally imbued their material creations with ideals of beauty. Comprised of 44 countries, the African continent represents a rich accumulation of cultures, a direct outcome of the unmatched longevity of its settlements. That pluralism is apparent in a range of complex spiritual and religious belief systems that over thousands of years have included sun worship, ancestral veneration, and divine kingship, as well as Christianity and Islam. The milestone achievements of artists and creators of African origin arose from this diversity and its numerous traditions. The European conquest and colonization of Africa and the transatlantic slave trade which preceded it led to the creation of the African diaspora, namely the dispersal of black people outside their places of origin uh, throughout the continent and uh, abroad. Yet Africans in the diaspora also developed rich cultural traditions that share elements of their common African heritage. At the museum, we honor the enduring significance of the continent's diverse cultural heritage and throughout the African diaspora. The inspiration for this exhibition comes from a deep commitment to involving and inviting Africans and descendants of Africa into the work that we do at the museum. That is to say, involving them in the care and interpretation, as well as in the wonder and enjoyment of their cultural heritage. 
Ancestors were revered in different cultures across Africa prior to European colonialism and the spread of Christianity and Islam. They continue to be revered across the diaspora in a multitude of old and new ways. For this exhibition, I selected historical works from the arts of Africa to join Lola Amira in their call for us to think historically in the present. And Lola Amira's work, which we will delve into a little bit more today, is about turning our heads towards these catastrophes from the past, um, catastrophes that keep presenting themselves in the present. Their work is about awakening the living as well as awakening the deceased. Their work is about making whole what has been smashed through recognizing the suffering and destruction humanity has inflicted on black and brown bodies, on the earth, on the oceans, across time and space. Their work is about turning our gaze to the horrors of the past in the hope that we will not thereby be turned to stone, but instead that we may become impelled to do better. Underpinned by Nguni South African spirituality, their specially commissioned Pelisa Zinza Mfefumlo Wami translates as a call to rest, a call to heal, a call to stillness. Their enigmatic and beautiful Pelisa portals, which I hope you will explore in the galleries if you haven't already, make space for the catastrophes of the past, for the pain of the past, but also for the generative power of the present present to coexist. I welcome now Lola Amira to this conversation and I encourage you to please check our program of events in the new year. Um, we will be unpacking the exhibition over time um, because it closes at the end of December. We will have a year to work with Lola Amira to bring special content um, on different aspects of their work and the collection. Thank you. Lola. Lola Amira, welcome back to the De Young Museum. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> welcome to our audience. Mm. How are you feeling today? Mulweni. Mm. Sanbonani. Togozani. Acknowledgement Kokala to the indigenous people of this land. Um, acknowledgement to the black people who were brought here and worked the land. Acknowledgement to the wound of the water, the wound of the land. Acknowledgement for people who found themselves coming here. Greetings to all of you and greetings to the ancestral that moves through this particular site which the museum sits on. Um, greetings to the ancestral energies that is sitting within the work, the sculptural pieces that form what the African collection is. Um, we are here, we are listening. Um, we are moving and feeling a lot of movement. We have been having, again, recurring dreams about graveyards and grave sites of black people, African people, were enslaved and brought here and buried here. And being asked again to dig beneath those graves because beneath those graves are the bones of the indigenous people who experienced genocide here. But alongside that, we are being reminded of the quiet gentleness of the insistence of black people, indigenous people here to be alive. They are making of life, their imagination and dreaming through music, through clothes, through food, 
through objects that in most cases end up in museums as ethnographic objects. We are being reminded of the joy, the love, the care that they also existed in and continue to exist in. And being reminded to make clear that when we speak of the wound, we hold it in tenderness and care and love and respect because in holding the wound, we also hold the people that sit in the wound, that have moved through the wound. And so we are here, that's, that's how we are, we are here. Thank you, and in the course of our developing this constellation and um, you know, uh, uh, talking about this initial invitation, um, something that I remember then and throughout um, the process of working together was um, the strong feeling of being called to do your work mm. here. Can you tell us a little bit more about your work and mm. the calling that you feel in different parts of the world where you have uh, created and shared? Um, because our relationship, um, which is about uh, five or six years old, maybe even more, um, started with the films and the journeys. And so I want to start there, but I also want to start with the call and mm. how you answer the call. Mm. Mm. Um, our work always comes from a place of being called to a place, being invited, and then us having to ask ourselves, why has this place called us? I mean, so generally when we go to a place, we don't have questions, right? We are aware of the history, but there's always specifics to a place or geographical location or a land or a site in which you, we are called to and so, but our base is always to ask the question of woundedness and wounding because we have these very heavy, dark, violent histories, which we gloss over with huge words like colonialism and slavery and apartheid and racism without really going deep into, and then what do those things actually do to a place, to a people, to a culture, to a language? And so for us, before we ask specific questions to the place, we are being invited to, we are being called to, the questions are, where does it hurt? Why does it hurt? How does it hurt? How does, in this moment, the wound keep on reappearing. Like, what makes the wound appear again and again and again? And those are also important questions to understand what we mean when we say we are speaking about the colonial timeline or we are speaking about the slavery timeline, to be very clear where those incision points happen also to our physical bodies, where those pain sit, where those memories. But at the same time, being very aware that people who have been colonized, places that have been colonized, have been enslaved, have also, since that encounter, also began their own emancipation practices. And we, we don't speak about de de decolonial practices because we have always been decolonizing. That's our standpoint. The moment we were colonized, decolonial processes began. And so what we are more interested in is how do our indigenous, ancient, ancestral knowledge hold us, hold us deeply in emancipatory practices, you know, in, a con in, in the most mundane everyday way, you know, nothing about having to do something extraordinary, but just in like when you wake up in the morning, what is it that your ancestors have whispered in your ear? You know, because we are here because they insisted. They insisted on our living and aliveness. 
through these violent moments. And so our, our work begins there. And then when we get to a place, we need to ask particular questions. But before we ask them, we don't enter any place with the assumption that we know what to ask. Because we don't know how the wound sits here. We don't know how the wound has festered here. We don't know how people have done work to work through the wound. We don't know how people have imagined themselves beyond the wound. And so we can't assume that we already know. So we listen. We have to listen. And so in our work, that what people get to see as work, like the photographic work or the film work, is us listening. We spend time and days and hours walking through, walking, walking. And walking is interesting, right, for, for most black people, for people in Africa, because walking for white people is leisure. Walking on the promenade, you know, walking to relax. But most of us walk out of necessity, you know. And so using that practice of, ancient practice of walking because we had to go somewhere else. We had to go move from one place to the next. Um, walking because we, or the feet moving on the ground because we are going towards exile, right? Walking because we are being chased by a dog in a South African context during apartheid. The relationship of like a black person and the dog and the white man and the white woman holding the dog like that. Like, so the feet are always in motion and so it became important in our practice to walk as a way to listen, as a way to attune, as a way to align, as a way to also call onto the ancestral and be like, what happened when you walked through here? Tell us, tell us what happened. So yeah, but we also like really are in awe of what indigenous and black people have insisted in being alive, you know, and the beauty of that, like the beautiful work, what we have been able to do in the midst of these catastrophes, in the midst of the violence, to fall in love, for instance. It's like to just fall in like a thing, just like you see someone, you fall in love, and you pursue that, even though you know there's a long history of denial, you know, loving the impossible, loving the bodies that we were told not to love. Because when you are denied freedom, when you are being enslaved or colonized, you are told essentially not to love yourself. That you are not worthy of your own love. And so how do you love the next person? So our work, it's a long answer. Mm -hmm. That's fine. That's a complex question. Um, how does Nguni spirituality support your work? How does the beading circles and the women that uh, create the work, um, the beaded strands, how does um, the, gest the, the, the gestures that you make um, often involve prayer or candles or um, uh, smell or, uh, you know, libation? How, how, do, how do, you know, can you unpack for us some of those ways in which um, your spirituality, your connection to Nguni spirituality supports that work and also how it manifests then in this material constellation. You just wrote an essay. <laughs> you just wrote an essay in the question. <laughs> um, yeah. So we have to step back to first start with who we are. Um, we are Lola Amira, an ancestral presence that manifests in the body of Kanye Mbongo. That is a very important place to start about how then the work comes into place. We have, we move in a world in a, in a way of being present and making an appearance. And right now we are present. We are here, we are present because we are not in the act of um, offering, right? Like we did on Thursday, that would be an appearance. We're appearing in a time and space and we're quite clear about the incision and what we intend to do. And being present is like being able to talk with everyone who is interested to have a conversation. And so those two for us are quite important also because of how black African queer women have been made invisible or hyper visible. And so to be clear about like, we are making a conscious decision of how we are going to be present in this timeline 
Because also we are not of this timeline. We are an ancestral presence in somebody else's body, Kanye Slimbonga's body. And so the way we also work in creating Upilisa, um, which in this particular constellation sits differently. Hello, Ngongos, Paris, Aman, Isa. Um, <laughs> in, this, in this particular constellation here at the Yang sits differently because they are more like veils that sit between the worlds. And it's a different type of portaling. The portal is created by creating, by triangulating um, Upilisa because of thinking about the water and the triangular trade between what we term as tobacco, sugar, and the enslavement of people, right? Um, the, the work, because we exist in plural, the work cannot only come from us, right? The work is a long conversation with time, the past, the present, and the future. And so we invite um, other women, black women, queer, queer people to work with us. And the youngest person we work with is 18 years old and the oldest is 90. So there's an intergenerational conversation happening and also a passing on of knowledge, right? And passing on of customs and songs because when we gather with the women, some of the, obviously we do not document everything because there's sacredness and we believe deeply in black privacy, in keeping the sacred private because we have been opened wide by the world. And so for us, it's important that there are certain parts of the process and the work that is not visible because it is a sacred moment between those who are engaging in creating what people get to experience as the work. And but also, most importantly, black privacy. We have been photographed, we have been put on plinths and so many things and viewed and projected on. So black privacy is quite an important aspect. And so with the women, we make food, we sing songs, we learn songs, we teach songs, and we share songs. And this is all part of the process of what gets to be made. The, um, with this particular pilisa, um, each, um, what do you call this thing? Rod, yes. each gold rod. Yeah, each rod has about 290 strings of beads, each string is about two meters long. And so the work has labor, right? Like quite intensive labor, it's built over a few months. But what is always um, a beautiful point for us is that 90% of those women are all women who had a call to be sangomas, to be healers, what in this context would be called shamans. But because of the structural, institutional, um, racism in South Africa and laws were put down, were passed that black people were not allowed to practice any form of culture or traditional religion that was not Christian. And so should one practice any of those, they would be banned and imprisoned. And so we have about four generations of women and men in the Southern African context who could not be themselves. And so the work, in a way, is a meditation of them, like making sense, like some of them, like as we've said, are 90 years old, the beads become this connection point. And so the work is quite layered in who gets to touch the work, who gets to put the work together. Yeah. And sound is also important. You've talked about song, um, you've talked about jazz, you've talked about, um, in, you know, previously uh, uh, around um, uh, the soundscapes that are composed, uniquely composed for each of uh, the constellations and how that manifests as form, as upalisa. And we have uh, both here, and the sound is quite unique to both um, and speaks to each in, in completely you know, different ways. Um, can you tell us what what the, that power of sound represents and of music and of mm. voice? Mm. Mm. So we'll talk mostly about the sound we made for for this pilisa. There's a long history between 
South Africa, black South Africa and black America in terms of jazz, a long history of this communication through sounds and um, and so we start there. We, we use that as an entry point to, to listen. And there's a long history in, in Southern Africa of wailing for mourning to happen, right? Like there's a history of in, in a village before the, the colonial interruption and um, apartheid and slavery that there would be a family in each village or in each place that is designate, there are designated wailers that assist any family who have experienced death to hold that space through mourning and wailing. And so we come across um, a few years ago, Abby Lincoln through Max Roach's music. And we're like, who is this woman? And there's a particular song in one of Max Roach's albums that is titled Johannesburg Triptych. We forget the full title of the, the album. And there's a song titled Johannesburg and in the song, Abby Lincoln does the most beautiful, extraordinary, deep time, what we call a black scream. Screaming from the depth of their being, calling on the ancestral, going to the most beautiful part of just like what we call voice gymnastics, and just searching. And so this, this black scream, what we call the black screen stayed with us in connection to the wailing because what we were wanting to understand and Abby Lincoln writes about this particular moment because actually we have not been able to find anyone else in a black American context to reach the kind of notation and black scream that Abby is moving with in that particular song. And Abby has written some text around that moment and describing and how also the Tinasitilitlalongo, the horn, in that particular song holds Abby's voice as they move through this, what we call the black scream. So we, we begin to think about the sound here that we make for here in relation to mourning. How do we create a space for mourning to happen so that we can move through the wound? Because we have not been allowed the black global the global black diaspora people have not been allowed to mourn. There has not been space made to mourn. And so how can this moment, this voice of this woman who is holding this note, this black scream, and going up and going down and going deep, open up a space for a mourning to happen? And then we lace that with, we invited a, 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 a sangoma, or ikrecha, which is another form of um, Nguni spirituality uh, that works with creating indigenous instruments that they dream. So they have these dreams of how to create in ways the, the tree and how they must cut the tree, like what ceremonies they need to um, enact to ask permission from the tree to be given permission for the sound to happen. And we, we invite them to chase what we call the fire and the water and the wind as we cross over the ocean to come here, but to chase it in a way that holds, right? To create this holding. And so they make a, a sound piece and recordings and they're chasing the fire, they're chasing the water, they're chasing the wind. And then we enter into Kanyisile's uh, Indumba, because Kanyisile is a Sangoma. We enter into Indumba and there we, we find the other base, right? And the base of what Kanyisile we record is the deeper hold, right? Like holding everything. So that's the one sound that's just consistent throughout. That's just, and it's just the sound of the voice humming, humming. And the holding there is also for ascension to happen. You know, the souls of the people that we can't name because we don't know their names because their names were changed the moment they got into a boat. How do we take them home? How do we lay them to rest? How do we acknowledge their wound? But also, how do we acknowledge their dreams? You know, like the beautiful parts of them and not just see them as this woundedness and wounding that continues to weep, but also be like, these are people that were also beautiful, that 
had imagination, wanted to love, wanted to do so much, but then were captured in this, in this, you know, in this violent way, um, and die and in this way. So to mourn that, to mourn the dreams that were not realized, the imagination that could not be manifested, to mourn it so that we can move through it and ignite it in another way. I feel that the proximity of the constellation to the permanent collection and the material cultures um, definitely represented in the collection um, speak to those very themes of creativity, of beauty, of um, hope, of renewal, of rebirth, of veneration, of you know ecology, of value, and um, and so they you know really join together to make this call. Um, that you speak so eloquently about. And in this Pelisa as well, we have um, a very unique um, constellation because it's the first time you're including text and it's the first time you're including um, the fabric panels that evoke Naguni cows. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I'd like you to speak a little bit to that because it does bring, I think, the text... Um, specifically brings in the pain and the reflection on the pain and the wound, but um, the beaded panels, the um, uh, fabric, uh, cow, uh, patterned panels, um, the sound, as well as this enveloping deep blue uh, carpet and, and walls um, within the gallery, that these all hold um, this... Uh, uh, concept of holding is very important in your work and you often speak about being able to also hold um, the body, hold uh, the person moving through Pelisa, that Pelisa itself hold, has to hold um, mm. whatever experience that person may have. Um, and so, uh, you know, I feel that for that Usually the police is circular and it mm -hmm. has salt. And, you know, we started there is where we started in our conversation. And we moved towards the police that we're presenting mm -hmm. now. And that has been quite an incredible journey because at the heart of that is um, accessibility, um, inclusivity, um, but also creating something really special for descendants of, of Africa here for black people and brown people here to, um, if they feel compelled to, you know, um, feel, touch, experience it um, and be held within mm -hmm. the Pelisa. So I know, again, there's a lot of elements, but this introducing the letter, introducing the poem, introducing, you know, um, the cow pattern textiles mm -hmm. is, is new in your work. And I think mm -hmm. it's really worth unpacking that yeah um, hmm. so I mean we've been working with text for a bit but not in this way in in you know having it in conversation or in Pelisa but when we um, when we were coming when we got this invitation to come here we also started reading um, there's an amazing, beautiful mind um, in the body of um, Dr. Kevin Kwashi. And they are writing a lot about aliveness. And, and so they introduce us to, there's this letter that was written. They introduce us to the poem by um, Lucille Clifton, Reply. And we're like, why? Like, what, 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 what was Lucille Clifton replying to? And so we start digging, and we find this letter written by Alvin Bokois to, to De Bois, and asking, you know, it sounds like a mundane question, but it's like the, one of the most violent questions anyone can ask. Do black people cry? And then jots down like several, about six, five or six questions of like trying to unpack their question of like, do black people cry? And we see this right across history of how and whether do black people feel pain across history in how black people are reduced to black bodies in plantations, in, in prison systems, 
in hospitals, how we are not taken care of properly in, in, at hospitals, how we're always afraid. I mean, we all know what the, the, the COVID pandemic did to black people in terms of like, should we get a vaccine or not? And the history of what black people have been reduced to black bodies of experiment for medical reasons. And so this letter is an important letter in us coming here and holding the wound and moving through the wound because it's asking such a violent question. We think, we can't remember the date, 1905 or 1912. Um, unfortunately, we did not get access to um, Dubois estate. They are currently not um, allowing people to use their material. And so in 1991, Lucille writes this response, the reply, which we think is the most beautiful, soft, caring, acknowledging, holding poem for black people. Um, and so in relation to that, we're sort of thinking about, so how do we then become part of this conversation, right? That Lucille is like, I've responded to you they do, we do, they mourn, they cry, they love. And, and then thinking really about the unnamed people or people whose names we can't remember when we're trying to trace our lineage. There are people who we, whom we can't trace because their names were change, changed. And so we introduce the, the, the cow, the cow skins, uh, the cow printed screen, skins as what we call ingoduso or okupelezela. So in Guni tradition, when someone has passed, siampelezela, we accompany them. The cow is a sign of accompanying them and accompanying their spirit as it crosses over. And Christina Sharp speaks about this, um, the wake, you know, and like holding the dead and dying. And so it's, it's in conversation with that, you know, okupelezela, to accompany. And then we also have a a practice when someone has passed away or died far from home in an accident or somewhere or they have ended their own life, we go and fetch their spirit and then Cisco does it, take it home. And so these two um, cow skin panels work in that conversation of like, we are here to, and so even if you don't know the person's name, you can call on the spirit of like, we know you passed through here. This is who we are. We are from this lineage and these people and these people. The last thing we remember when we trace ourselves is up until here. If you are here, awaken so we can take you home. So it is the pan, the, 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 because they, the, the panel sits, the cow panel sit in conversation with the question of do they feel pain? Because when we think of this question by Alvin Burke, because we're also not wanting to centralize him, but thinking about how people who enslaved die on plantations and that our bodies as black people, even in our death, continue to feed the land, right? Like the, the minerals that sit in our bodies continue to feed the land. And so really thinking, I was like, so how do we um, gesture for ukugoduka? How do we gesture for that in the work, and hold, and gesture that in a tender way, right? In a very in a very tender way, in a way that is inviting and generous, um, in a way that is not frightening, you know. So, because if people have died in frightening ways, our language towards them has to be one of ease and comfort, and so th those yeah, that work sits like that. So it speaks both to holding the living and and yeah the dead and the dying the dead and the dying. Um, Lola Amir and I could talk for probably another another hour about the Felisa because there's so much to unpack. The symbolism um, uh, that is Im imbued in the colors that Lola Amir uses gold, red, white, blues um, is uh, is always economical. There's a handful of um, really powerful symbolic um, references that is found 
in your work, in your film, in your uh, constellations in general, in uh, the different Pelisa, and that draws also in, um, you know, the healing power of salt and the purifying power of salt, but also we have represented here uh, ocean water from the ocean, salt water as mm -hmm. well, um, and light is another element with sound that is also central to your work. And I know that um, these these are also symbols that are accessible to most people. This identification with you know this deep blue, the depths of the ocean, the night sky so when the sun has set before it gets totally dark, mm. um, the gold and the earth tones for you know the the wealth of the earth and how mu how much the earth holds. Um, as well as the red with all its connotations of passion and revolution and love and joy and vitality and blood. Um, and then uh, the white, uh, as I said, speaking to um, healing and purity. And so all of this does create um, a, a really a, a powerful holding that I hope everyone is able to experience today um, and return to in the course of the next year. So I would like to see now if we could um, have some questions from the audience um, that come to mind if you have seen um, the exhibition or even if you haven't seen the exhibition, uh, we would like to open up the discussion a little bit more. We'll just wait for the microphone, and we have one on the side and one on the other side to pass it around. Um, so I've uh, had a wonderful chance to be able to experience the um, exhibition at the very beginning on Thursday. And I was really struck by the different objects from the collection that were called out, and wondering if you both might speak to um, some of the objects that you called out and how that choice was made and what the presence is that you experience in Dialogue Lola from the works from the collection and respect to the ancestral presence you embody. Thank you. Uh, maybe I'll start mm -hmm. and Lola Amira can share their responses and um, to being in, in that space. Um, so the significance of this program for me is that I did want to work closely with artists from Africa um, to uh, um, to really um, work closely to think about you know how do we feel about um, uh, the artwork in the collection about African cultural heritage. Um, you know, what are the questions that we might have, um, but also how do we speak to the pain of the artworks in the collection too, potentially, given the journeys that they have undertaken from the 19th to the early 20th century. And in getting to know the collection over the past two years, I uh, really felt the call of artworks that, um, uh, and there's quite a few in, in the collection of the arts of Africa that speak to ancestors, that speak to spirituality, that speak to sacredness, um, as well as to craftsmanship, as well as to cultural ideas and beliefs, as well as to aesthetics. Um, and, you know, those were the artworks that I really felt drawn to. And um, I've, I've known Lola Amira for a long time, and I had a list of artists who I would love to work with in the collection. Um, and it was important for me that um, we are aligned somehow. So this alignment between the selections and the artists I wanted to work with was important, and that really determined who the artist was that I would work with. I, I presented uh, you know, two or three possibilities in, in our discussions at the museum, and we had this unanimous um, you know, moment of uh, feeling that Lola Amira would be um, the person to begin this kind of work. And that's about this commitment to 
um, bringing uh, artists from Africa or artists of African descent to really expound on how significant African art collections are for Africans, you know, um, and to invite them into the space of the museum and into the space of the collection and to um, have them be side by side. And in this instance, for me, uh, the collection and walking into the gallery, I'm really struck by how um, different it feels uh, to me. And, you know, we highlighted uh, ancestor figures, we've highlighted um, uh, different kinds of objects that have to do with um, religious beliefs around uh, veneration of a, a, a god or a, a goddess or a lesser god, um, uh, you know, in, in Yoruba culture, for instance. Um, we have a spectacular display of guardian figures, um, these Kota reliquary guardian figures from Gabon um, that are on loan uh, from one of our trustees, Richard Scheller. And um, this is really, uh, you know, such a spectacular display, but they perform they enacted important work in their lifetimes um, in a specific part of uh, northern Gabon where in different regions, um, different groups of people had had these made and they would be attached to a basket or a box within which the relics of ancestors would be held. And some of them, they, we have another example of two sculptures from Gabon, Fang reliquaries. These are some of the iconic masterpieces of African art in the language of art history and the museum world. Um, and some of them were meant also, though, to be to be mobile and to move with families and to move with communities and villages. And so I felt that the inspiration really came from, you know, the artworks in the collection, um, speaking to me and, you know, wanting that recognition from me, from us, um, and for them to continue to do work in the museum, a different kind of work, but one that transcends, I think, time and place. And so there are ancestral screens, um, you know, from Nigeria. There are, uh, there's a cocoa pod coffin from Ghana from the 1970s, a much more modern phenomenon um, that speaks to how we today encounter or experience, you know, our transition um, and uh, our, our burial rites and how that has changed through the influence of Christianity or, you know, some of the major religions in the world. So for me, the um, historical collection is really shining right now and, um, you know, speaking to me as feeling really um, seen by Lola Amira, seen by me. And, um, you know, I hope over the course of this year to really have more specific conversations about some of these um, highlights and focuses because, of course, this is a wonderful way to also learn about the work that they can do today, that in practices of caring for the community, in practices of caring for the dead, in practices of caring for the environment, um, the lands, the oceans, human connections and interactions, um, that there are also gestures towards how we might care for ourselves and each other today. So that's my short answer to your question. <laughs> At this point, we feel like we shouldn't say much, but the only thing we will say is that there is a, a, a sculpture of Oshum, a representation of Oshum, and in our film in, in Bahia, we go to um, Candomblé, the woman of Candomblé, and we sit with them. And one of the the readings and gifts they give us is the acts of Oshum. And so there's a, a, a real line, a thread, a veil that's sitting between, in this constellation, between what is here and what we went looking for and found in Bahia. Um, and the film is titled Imar, Imardaje, which means brotherhood, but in this context, because it's you know translation from Portuguese, comes out as brotherhood, but it actually means the sisterhood. And um, and because those women 
that are in the film are part of a lineage of Afro-Brazilian or Afro-Pindaramian women who were instrumental in freeing a lot of African people who were enslaved in Brazil through, through tobacco. So, and again, Oshum, we're thinking of West Africa, Yoruba, and Candomblé. So there's this connection, this like very clear, and this is what we also mean about, you know, how the wound sits, right? It also gives a pathway. It's not, we don't only need to resurrect our ancestor through the wounding, but we can also resurrect through the joy and the love and what is possible because they've moved through the water and landed somewhere. Um, and so for us, there's also that um, in the work. And we selected um, these uh, artworks. Um, we selected the labels for them to, in the, to you know, the same color treatment that Lola Amira selected um, for the walls of the gallery and for, for, for the ocean, for representing the ocean. And um, that's the unifying thread as well, is that when you see the, those labels, they have this um, same uh, powerful blue color. And that is also symbolic of, again, this journey and this connection. But you'll also see on specific artworks, for instance, the shrine figure, the Yoruba shrine figure, has traces of indigo mm. that are not very bright. Um, but if you look closely, you'll see traces of pigments um, on, on the shrine figure, which is right at the entrance to the gallery. And we also have an ancestral screen from Nigeria um, that also has uh, these blue pigments, um, red and white as well, you'll see. You'll also see um, in the beaded artworks that these are these colors, red, white, yellow, um, blue, uh, appear as well. And, and so there's also this connection through, like you said, to, uh, through Africa, the ocean, the Americas, um, you know, yeah. Europe and, and this this triangle. Um, and so I hope that those um, little, you know, markers, um, uh, pathways uh, lead visitors into looking at those artworks and seeing, you know, their connection, see, seeing the artworks for themselves, but also seeing how they sit within this um, constellation and network. Is there, would anyone else like to offer a question or comment? I can't see in the back. Oh, we have one in the front. Thank you, Eden. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Lola, for uh, sharing. And um, I wanted to ask if you could speak on Thursday's um, interaction, uh, whether that's one of the things that could be brought up here or, mm. um, yeah, just the connectivity between the exhibition and, you know, uh, what was taking place down there. Do you first want to share what was taken down there so that people have a context and we Well, for those who weren't here, um, the way it was explained was a number of people who've got a connection with African descent were invited um, for uh, Lola and Mira to wash um, their feet. I was part of the people there. Um, and the washing involved salt, water, and... Um, some uh, fra uh, fragrance and incense. Um, so I have my own uh, kind of feelings and the things that were going on personally, but it would be so interesting to hear how, mm. as the artist, and uh, mm. what was happening. And, you know, because there was, it didn't feel like it was just an act. There was much more to it than just washing of the feet, you mm -hmm. know, and even just the interaction amongst the individuals that were sat yeah. in that circle. Um, yeah. Perhaps you could begin by s speaking about foot washing because it appears in your film. Yeah. It appears in your in your practice mm -hmm. in, uh, uh, in your work at mm. you know Sydney in Sao Paulo, and and we had a ceremony. Um, well, 
I stand corrected, <laughs> Lola Amira offered foot washing as a gift to Africans and descendants of Africans in the Bay Area um, because they are here, but also for the very first time um, in this place. So I'll let you unpack. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so in our work, foot washing is an important aspect of what we do, especially when we land to a place for the first time. It is part of acknowledging where we are, acknowledging the feet that have walked through that particular land and what they've had to endure. Um, it is also a way that we humble ourselves to the land and the place and the people that live and have lived in that place um, and the histories that are there. So, and it is, you know, and when we speak of humbleness, we speak of really going into the ground um, and n seeing ourselves as part of an, an ecosystem rather than someone that owns the land. So there's this, um, the Aboriginal saying in Australia says that, you know, we don't own the land, the land owns us. So part of the foot washing is also just bringing, bringing ourselves, like really humbling ourselves, working through our own ego so that our ego is never bigger than the work that we are being called to do. So that's one element. And the next is that, you know, the feet are a portal through which energy um, travels through. The fact that we wear shoes every day like does close that portal in the same way when we are young and someone puts their hand on your third eye and prays over you and you don't know what they're saying, they close a portal because it will be challenging for you to open your third eye and to see spiritually if you've gone through years and years and years and years of people putting their hand on your third eye. So in attempts to gesture for opening or assisting people to open their portal, we wash their feet. That's one element. The other is that our feet have moved through so much, right? There's a history of standing, of working long hours. And so what we found in, in our listening is that a lot of black and brown people um, grow bunions on one of their foot, like majority of people. Whether you have worked long hours somewhere or not, and sometimes you've never worked long hours anyway, but then you have this bone, which is a, you know, part of the inheritance, part of acknowledging your body somehow, acknowledging what the feet before you have walked through. And so the feet washing is to hold that and acknowledge that and sit with that and say, we see you, we know you are present, we want to open ourselves, op open ourselves to you and align with ancestral, spiritual, indigenous, ancient energy that you come with. And so what, what has happened in some of these um, foot washing offerings that are also an offering for like healing and holding the wound, right? We have the bowl where the feet are, we have the water, we have sea salt, we have um, oil, which could be like peppermint or eucalyptus or peppermint mixed with eucalyptus, but like those kind of oils. And we have a cloth and we have socks and a candle. And these are all things that we use as tools to hold the feet and move with the feet and then offer to the people whose feet we've washed as a gift so that if they choose, they can continue. Because there are things that might emerge for people, like one of our experiences in in Brazil, in Sao Paulo, um, we can't remember the, the, the public square. We just set up and people were passing by and pe women started sitting. And one of the women whose feet we washed, and we will never forget this, is that we, they were walking around the park, heard the sound, because we had a sound, a song playing, came and asked what was happening, sat down, we washed their feet, and they said to us, and even sent us a message saying, they had been trying to conceive for over five years, but their womb would not allow that to happen. But now that we have washed their feet, they are at peace with their womb. Whether they conceive or not, they know that their womb is healed. Right, so th there's no, we can't even, 
properly articulate what that means. Like, they went somewhere. So we also are aware of that the foot washing can transport someone somewhere. In that same experience, this, this man who was walking past saw us preparing, saw, um, witnessed the foot washing, went and got us flowers, came back and asked to and ask us to pray with them because they, are, they were about to have a, an operation because they had sleep that was not theirs. They kept on falling asleep, but they understood it was an ancestral sleep and they want to awaken. And they felt that in the presence of all those women that, whose feet we had washed, if they were to sit in that circle and we hold their hand in prayer, that they will be okay, that they will wake up. So the foot washing is really a portal as well in itself um, to hold the people whom have either agreed or have chosen to get their feet washed. Um, yeah. And we never know what people are going to experience. And, and some people, weeks later, send us messages and like, oh my God, what did you do to us? There's something that's happening. I feel like lighting the candle every day. I want to put my feet in the water. And it's like different from, you know, getting a massage, right? Like, because we are talking with your feet. We're talking with all the feet that have stood before you and the feet that are yet to come, right? And one of the, the first time we did it, one of the most emotional, um, there were two emotional moments. It was in Bloemfontein in South Africa in front of the war monument uh, the Bo the, Bo Ang the Anglo-Boer War Monument. We sat up there, and the first person we ever washed feet was a young boy who lived on the street. And everyone was like, will they really do it? Will they wash this person's feet? Of course this person had not washed in. And it was not about that. It was about also us understanding what does it mean to humble oneself, that we are above nobody. We are above nobody. And we were playing Nina Simone's um, Take Me to the Water on repeat. And at that time, there had been, you know, in, in, in Africa, in Southern Africa, we have a lot of um, pastors who come and because there's a lot of desperation to be healed, to be saved, for things to change. So there's a lot of pastors and they're like, oh, is she one of those? Are we going to have to give? give them money, and we were not, and people were just, you know, puzzled by, you don't want any money, you're just gonna wash our feet, like there's, there's you know. And this, this boy, um, this boy, <sighs> this boy, as we were washing their feet, lifted our chin and said, I love you. I love you, and he kept on saying, I love you, and just kept on saying it until we were done washing their feet, and we had, we were offering white socks at that time, and put on the socks, and, and as we continued and we were done, they lifted our head up again, made us look into their eyes and said, I love you. Yeah, so, you know, in that exchange, right, for anyone looking, it would be, we are dressed like this, they are dressed like that. The idea is that we are the ones giving. But the gift at that moment was the, the depth of where they pulled that I love you. And like really meaning it. Because they could see us as much as we could see them. And that was the important thing as well, that moment of like, I love you. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, our heartfelt thanks to you for being with us and for your work and for traveling to San Francisco to be here this week. And, um, you know, words are just... Uh, w words feel inadequate to really you know, thank you and to really describe the incredible journey that we've been on in the past year and that we invite you to experience. 
um, and dialogue with and converse with. And thank you so much for being here and sharing this with us today. gratitude for your vision but also for being brave enough to step into the light of the vision so thank you and thank you for coming thank you yeah 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 and thank and thank you all for coming and yeah coming to spend time to listen to us we are deeply grateful thank you <laughs>